The guest has arrived. The host is prepped and ready. Ladies and gentlemen, this is One on One with Bill Alexander. Hi, everyone. Yours truly, William Eric Alexander. All my friends call me Bill, and you're One on One with Bill Alexander. Well, today... You're going to recognize the face, you're going to recognize the voice, but you probably don't recognize the name. The individual I'm talking to today is Larry Hank. And Larry, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing well. That's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, disease free. Well, that's good at to hear. The moment, at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, hope, hopefully you, you, you can make it through this without uh, getting sick and and whatever you have coming up in the near future, you'll be able to do. But I was going through some stuff and I, I'm familiar with you from Friends, from Seinfeld. I even saw you on an episode of Mr. Belvedere from wow. years ago. And well, because I'm from Western Pennsylvania and Belvedere was based in Western Pennsylvania outside of Pittsburgh, it was one of those shows as a kid that you would watch. And that's one of the reasons why, because most people don't even remember the TV series for the most part. Well, well me, me neither. And I mean it. Um, I mean, but but this is also an amazing thing because I've done hundreds of interviews and this is the first time Mr. Belvedere has come up. I, what the heck? Well, you, you, were, you were robbing a grocery store is what you were doing. Oh, great. I like that. Yeah, oh, so, and I've seen you on episodes of, uh, what is it, uh, Miami CSI. Uh, you always played someone that was high or someone that was just not um, all with it. Um, well, I like that. I like the, these the off, offbeat characters. Yeah. These where you have to think a little to go, well, where, where is this guy at? Cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like that. But, I, I, just, I, I was just... just I, in the last two days, I've been offered parts. Uh, oh, really? And I generally, yeah, yeah. and generally, I don't turn down anything. I mean, you know, but uh, as I uh, get into my golden years, I, I started to have a little, um, I, I, I choose, I pick and choose a little more. So I just turned down two parts just because it didn't, it didn't have that quirk that right that, you know it was just an ordinary person i, I don't do ordinary people <laughs> well i don't do them well i, I do them but not well well you, you the one of the ones that i think is great and i had the opportunity to look it back at some of them over the past week or so is you doing the mr heckles character on friends yeah, which yeah really no, wasn't a big part it was just enough to set the set the mood whatever it may be because you were the neighbor that did not like noise of any kind and the way you the way you played that character is someone would say something and then your response would be well i could do that well i could do. and the yeah. one i'm thinking of you were chandler's roommate when some guy was moving in to chandler's and you said well no i could be chandler's chandler chandler's roommate and you would go through that whole thing and it was a great character when you play these parts do you have input on the dialogue or is it already done? I mean, I can. I mean, I'm I'm allowed to now. I'm 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 old enough to have you know be able to make choices. Uh, in the beginning, no. I mean, you just read it as you know. But can I change this word? Just just read it the way you, you know you do it. Do it the way it's written. But now, but Mr. Heckles was perfect. He was just he was just lightning out of a bottle. Uh, he. I didn't do a thing with that character. It was written, and I did it because it was great the way it was written. Uh, he, the attitude was on the paper, on the page. Uh, everything was right there. I just had to say the words and put on the costume. I, I could do it even without the costume. It, it was just say the words, and, and it would come out Mr. Heckles. It was, it's the most perfect part I've ever done as far as that and old Joe. Was yes, from perfect uh i didn't have to do anything um i if, if there was any kind of reference point for me for mr heckles and old joe was two relatives of mine uh one was uh, that mr heckles <laughs> was my my mother's father my grandfather okay uh he 
At one point, I remember as a child, I was about seven. And my, my mother said, all right, put your, car, put your coat on. We got to go uh, visit grandpa. Uh, I go, you know, why? I, I didn't want to go. I don't want to. I, I want to go play with my friends, you know. No, we got to go because, you know, she was minding me or something. It was Saturday, whatever. I had to go with my mother. Why, why are we going to grandpa's? Well, he's the manager of a building. He, that's how he, right. he, he was the manager of an apartment house. So that's how he got a free, to, free apartment, you know, because he's the manager. But he had to take care of the apartments and, and take out the garbage and keep it clean. You know, he's the manager. And he wouldn't do any of that. He did <laughs> the free apartment. <laughs> so every once in a while, my, my mother would say, all right, we have to go in and calm down the, the you know, the, the apartment owner whatever the the tenants right gotta go calm down the tenants your grandpa isn't doing his job again come on so my mother would go out there and she'd holler at you know her father you know my grandfather you got to take out the garbage you know that so she would my grandfather and my mother would watch them taking out the garbage for the apartment so that's mr heckles right there uh, you know no why should you know I, I did i did it last week you know why these people they don't you know he and uh, old Joe was my Uncle Murray. Uh, he was an oil burner mechanic. I, I don't know if you call him a mechanic. He okay. installed them. He was an oil burner. And stuff. This is, you know, back in the 50s, you know. Uh, and he would come home. Uh, he would used to babysit for me. So I used to go over his house. They would leave me at his house. He had two kids, same age as me. So, and his wife. So we would, uh, I would be over there and, and he would come home from work all greasy and installing oil burners and fixing them and, mm -hmm. you know, mechanical things. He was great. He was the best at what he did. But um, he had, he was old Joe. I mean, he like owned a junkyard. He, he would just, he dressed like old Joe. He, he looked like old Joe. <laughs> I look like my like old. Okay. Um, um, so when did you decide you were going to go into the, the profession of acting? Never. 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 I mean, eventually I did. And so I guess you would say, well, that was your choice. Then you chose when you became an actor. That was right. Yeah, but it was just a fumfering kind of, well, I'm here, I'm there, I'm I started out as a stand-up comedian. I'm a, I'm a storyteller. Okay. That's what I am. I'm a born storyteller. That's how I got out of trouble all my life. Just, well, it was like this, officer. And they go, oh, yeah, well, that, okay, fine. No, no he's okay. Uh, and so I was always doing that. And then I became a stand-up comedian. And that was a really good one. I was opening for Woody Allen and Miles Davis and the Kingston Trio and I was touring. I did the Playboy circuit. So I had a life before acting, a very full life before acting. And then I, uh, I got into critical thinking, uh, a comedy. You know, George Carlin, right. Lenny Bruce, Bill Burr. There's a lot of them now. Yeah. But back in the day, uh, George Carlin, you know, uh, Richard Pryor. And I couldn't take it. I wasn't ready for it. I was just a funny guy. I won funny guy in high school twice. So it's just funny, you know, and that's how I kept gang members from beating me up, you know, or they would protect me. That was the interesting thing. In high school, the gang members protected me because I made them laugh. It was amazing. One time a, a, a bully started to push me around. He didn't beat me up, but he wanted, he wanted to start a fight, but he wanted me to throw the first punch. So he would just, you know, yeah, what's, you know, and his girlfriend said, you know, leave him alone, leave him alone. You know, we were just talking. He was right. just jealous, you know. Right. So, and I've had that trouble all through my life where guys think I'm doing something with their girlfriends. It's mm -hmm. really weird, man. But I'm funny. So they just, you know, want to talk to me. That, right. That's the, so he started, and she started to protect me. Like, leave him alone, leave him alone. And I'm thinking, no, let him beat me up. I don't want a girl just protecting me. Get out of here. You know, I mean, that's what I was thinking. Don't no, don't tell him to leave me alone. I'll let, if you're gonna fight, let him beat me up. Or I'll I'll fight back, but I, I couldn't win. I guess right. So uh so I became a stand-up comedian and then 
I got into critical thinking. So uh, and my manager, who was Woody's manager, I mean, he was an intelligent guy. He knew the business. He said, look, why don't you join Second City? They're doing Carlin material, prior material, Lenny material, but they own the, the theater, man. They'll throw the, you know, the people will... The cops were taking me off the stage, you know, and, and people were coming at me with beer bottles. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, get the fuck off the stage, man. Bring on the Kingston Trio. Whoa, oh. man. You know, with a beer bottle. Get the fuck off the Okay, okay. So I thought, so he said, join Second City and you won't have that trouble. They'll throw right. it out, you know. So that's what I did. I auditioned, I got in. And then from there, a couple of us, six of us split. And said, let's go we'll join, we'll make our own theater improv. So we went to San Francisco and started the committee. So now I'm only 500 miles from Hollywood. Right. I'm right up there. And it was only $35 round trip flight in, oh, in wow. the, the early 70s. Round trip, $35 to fly from Hollywood to San Francisco and back. So that's what the heavy hitters were doing the green lighters and the, you know, CEOs and stuff and casting people because to fly to Chicago was just too much of a tr trouble, a lot of expense. Hotel. Right. So they just fly up. They could get back uh, and sleep in their own beds if they really wanted to get a catch an early show and fly back, you know, right. An hour and a half flight. So that's what they were doing. And they would just cast us. They would just come up, see us in this improv show. We were a big hit. We were a tourist attraction. We were as big as Second City. Mm -hmm. So we had gigs. We, we, were, we didn't need Hollywood. So they would come up and say, well, come back down for a week, you know. And in an improv, which is not like stage plays, you could, you could leave because people would just improv your part. They would just come in, you know. Okay. The other people would do your part. Or they would just leave it out and, and improv, improvise another Robin. scene really simple so you'd go down for a week or a day and come back because that was your gig and so I, I was an actor without being an actor I was an improviser and still being funny guy off the top of my own head we all were but then the money started to the the the, the green siren the, the and and so a lot of us would go down for a day or a week and then not come back Okay. You know, and then, so there was this, and, and nobody was coming back to teach new people, you know, how to do it because we right. were losing the original company. I was the only one left. After, and then when the director left, he said, well, you're, yeah, Larry, you're now the director. Goodbye. <laughs> and then I discovered why he left. I, 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 I didn't know why he left. I mean, because he had a company, he was directing, he was, a, you know, we were a tourist attraction. But then when he left, and I, I suddenly realized we've been here for now, like seven years or something, we were an established company. But since the drift was down and not back, we had to replace the original company all the time with people from San Francisco, or Northern California, but nobody from New York, or Hollywood or Chicago, where all the all the good actors are, except right. the natural ones who are hidden, and they don't, you know. So I was why he left was he had a company. I was the only one in the company who was an original, and everybody else was like the 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 first first uh, the third or the fourth or the fifth replacement. Mm -hmm. So I was dealing with really people who hadn't improvised you know we they were like i was teaching them i right. would be holding a class and it didn't work it was very frustrating because it wasn't funny as you know we were all we were called mr uh, uh mr meets trained dobermans <laughs> mr meat was the director and we were the, the Dobermans. trained dobermans i got you and we, were the, and we were satirists man and we really went for it that's why we were popular you know, we weren't in Chicago. We weren't in, we had no, I mean, we were Lenny Bruce, George Carlin, <laughs> Richie Pryor, and it wasn't working. So I, I said, 
fuck it, man. I'm, yeah. I'm going back to, I'm you, going down to LA with all the rest. You so that's how the name out. and I don't, and, and I, I know that you worked with them because I saw the clip that George Carlin had a TV show. Oh yeah. Played. I played a lobster or you he played, played a lobster. You played I, Kenny I the Crawdad and yeah. you were drunk. And the one line is I never promised to be, I never said I was a role model because you were on an investigated program and they established that you were drunk as the mascot for the wine company. Oh, I guess. I don't, I don't remember that in detail, <laughs> but I remember doing a scene with a lobster or yes. a crawdad. And it, and, it, and it is really funny. But you've done a lot of parts like that. Um, yeah. Another one, and, and this was in the beginning of the, of the program, which became a, a hit, is you were playing the Halloween guy on Home Improvements with... Uh, Tim Allen and you were there to scare the kids and I saw this this is what's really funny when I knew I was going to talk to you it was on TV as a rerun on one of the nostalgia channels and I'm watching going I never knew he was on here I mean it was brief but it was a strong enough character that you remember who you were in that part well it turns out I remember doing the part i remember the character but i don't remember dialogue and stuff right like that. i remember doing it uh and i thought it was a failure when i watched the show after i had done i looked at it and i go oh my god man i'll never work again you know so that that's that in other words i guess my memories of all the shows have to do with an emotional response right either I, it was happy or sad or uh, angry or whatever and that was, uh, I was depressed. That was the, that was the, the emotional tag was, uh, it was a to total failure. But I, I watched it, I don't know, maybe last year uh, for the first time in a uh, length of time. And it was, yeah, it was okay. Uh, the thing that I remember on all those parts were they were, they were just little cameos. They weren't right. parts, they were cameos. And they got the right guy for those parts, for that part, I don't think it would have stood out as much if they had got somebody else. And those, I was an expert because of my improv history and my stand up and all that. Everything to me is instant. You know, in stand up, um, I, I wouldn't write anything. I would just get up on the stage and talk about my day. Right. right just like I'm talking to you. Uh, but just, uh, by the feel of the room and the audience, I could tell where the laughs were or where I could go to get them. I could, again, it was an emotional thing. I never wrote anything, ever, ever. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to write a joke. Oh, really? Words, I didn't, yeah, I, I know how to write. I know how to write. Right. Scenes, I know, but I didn't know the setup, and I know setup and punchline. I also know reference. You know, you got to give the milieu and then right. the setup and then the put. I had all that straight and I get up on the stage. And like I say, I, I had I was opening for Woody Allen and Miles Davis. Miles wanted me to tour. So I understood comedy, but I didn't know how to put it into words. I would go, OK, set up. OK, what's a good punchline? You know, and I would sit there for hours. Well, no, that's not funny. And then I would get some idea and then I would bring it on the stage. Like I wrote a joke. Yeah, I wouldn't make that announcement, but I'd sort of slip it into my talk, but it would never get a laugh. No matter what I wrote would never work. So I just stopped. I go, okay, I just get up there. And, and you know, my day was not like anybody else's day. I, I mean, that was the hook. And it was my day was, you know, hanging out with junkies and people <laughs> getting arrested, you know, and having fights with their wife. I mean, it was right. just a functional life that I had that I just bring to the stage. And it was just hysterical. But, you know, if I wrote, it was just like white bread, you know, mayonnaise. Right, just... right. So we just got past the holiday season and you are in two of the most iconic holiday movies. The first one is Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, where you're Doobie the taxi driver with uh, John Candy and Steve Martin. Right. which is an excellent part. And I don't remember if you even said anything. It was just the way you looked in that role. I think I said, uh, because it was told to me, I wouldn't remember it. But right. uh, I think I said, there's nothing to see on the freeway, but the freeway. Oh, that's right. Because you were going through the small town. You were going the long way. That's right. 
Yeah, and, and I want to show looked, you around. And you looked like a junkie driving a taxi is what you looked like. And the taxi was all tricked out. And the other oh, one geez. is you played the police officer in the first Home Alone. And with, a Balzac. with a donut in your hand and beaten on a wall. Um, being able to do that. Do people recognize you from those films? Home Alone, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Friends, Mr. Heckles. Uh, so those are the top three. Mr. Heckles is the top one. Okay. And then, then uh, comes uh, Doobie. And then comes uh, Balzac. And then Kramer, when I imitated I did uh, Kramer. Yeah. Kramer. So those are the four big ones. Now, as I'm known for those four. Those four equal one leading role. Okay. As far as memory goes. I mean, right. they come from different sections. So they're not the same demographics right. for each show. So I have, so it's really weird. Uh, but they all follow their demographic movie. Oh, interesting. It, 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 there's no, there's no cross-pollination or anything. Okay. In other words, the people who like old Joe don't know the other three. I mean, they kind of do. But it's, I mean, Breaking Bad had it has its own demographic, you know, guys, you know, say eighteen to to thirty five, guys, right? It's Breaking Bad, uh, Friends, the Mr. Heckles is just mothers and daughters, period. That's it, man. Which would no make problem. sense, the demographic. You're right. Uh, and then. Uh, the the other two the same families for uh, uh, for those two uh, planes trains and uh, home alone is uh, families and uh, older men who watched it when they were a kid who, who had a, a connection to Culkin to uh, what's his name okay you know, Paul, Paul. yeah so the the kids watched the kid and then he grew up and Macaulay <laughs> stayed the same poor poor Macaulay his uh, not poor Macaulay. His brother. He has a brother who's on a hit in a hit show on Broadway, or was. Uh, yeah. Um, his name okay. starts with an M, like all of them did. Yeah. Okay, Malcolm. I don't know. Well, yeah, maybe but, it. So, but, so he was on a show like yours, like this. Yeah. Where they were interviewing Malcolm Culkin, who was in a Broadway hit show at the time. So he was advertising the show and. Blah, blah, blah. And all they did, all the interviewer did, was ask him about Macaulay. Okay. I mean, it was sad, sad, you know, just as a, as a performer, I'm, I'm watching, I'm listening. I, I wasn't watching, I was listening. I was in the car, I was on a car radio. Uh -huh. So I'm listening to the radio. And I did, yeah, well, what about Macaulay? Well, you know, did he think this? And Macaulay, and the kid, you know, Malcolm was doing his best to be nice. And he said, well, my brother thought this and- you know, Right. But- I mean, it's just a waste of time from from Malcolm. Yeah. I mean, I guess the interviewer was getting off on it, but poor. And then Macaulay, I don't know if he's even working or, uh, anymore, but he's older. He doesn't look like. No, he doesn't look like a, a, a nine-year-old kid anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, and that's what happens. Uh, and uh, that's what started happening to me. Uh, well, to any actor, you, you, your hair turns gray, you get older. I just, read a um and, and they're casting you in the same parts because they see you as a young man so they give your agent a call hey well you know it's a part like that the guy is 95 what are you talking about click <laughs> i mean but that's what goes on right it's just really crazy so i'm i'm watching um he was i i i think it was imdb or aol or whatever right and uh, it's not some internet. And this woman who uh, they're doing a re a, a re up of this woman's show uh, that was big hit, uh, a, a, a Sex in the City. Yes. So they're doing a re re repeat. The reboot, that. yeah. So they call it reboot. So they're calling. I mean, it's just so. Um, they called all the all the the ex actresses of. Sex in the City, the original actresses of Sex in the City. Well, I don't know. I don't, give a guess. What is that? Twenty years ago? At least, yeah. At least twenty years ago. Well, the difference between forty and sixty in looks. 
is big. There is a change. Some yeah. people change very slow. You can pull it off, but these women, no. They made their, their bones and their money on Sex in the City, the original, and retired. They don't have to work, and their husbands are working. So they don't even know about acting anymore. And now they say, hey, a reboot. So one of the actresses said, she, you know, she said, yeah, it's money, you know, right. And it was a big hit show. So, and then she goes in and does like the first episode or, you know, they were banking them. And so she's watching and she, she said, oh, oh my God. Yeah. I'm like, Look, oh my God. I don't want to be in the show. Oh my God. Wow, man. Uh, I just, well, it, it's a, it's a, I guess a double-edged sword. It's th that woman. I felt, well, I felt contempt and sad for her. You know, right. oh, come on, get off it, will you, lady? Yeah. You know, you're human. Uh, you think about this. Okay, so that was one thing. And then the, the showrunners, the, the the producers. Well, what did you think? You know, I mean, what, either. I just don't know. I, I, I don't know. But it's that wall that I sensed when I was 35, when I was watching TV. Hmm. And I saw all the... TV sitcom dads were all ex actors that as a kid I looked up to mm. in movies and I thought oh my god there's actors hell right yeah. in front of me <laughs> and I said no no not me so I started when I was 35 and I okay. have proof I have proof I drew what I wanted to be when I was 65 or 70 what kind of actor i would be what i would be doing so i drew it when i was 35 and um it was, it was rather complete drawing i mean you know i really got into it and i'm a good drawer i mean i'm a painter so oh these these are your works behind you my, yeah i'm a I, i'm a painter. oh wow yeah so i got 40 of them on my internet i uh, okay. add uh here's an advertisement uh the real larry hankin.com they're on t-shirts and they're you know, big uh, museum, museum uh, prints. I mean, wow. you can in a museum. I right? didn't realize that. That's cool. Uh, so um, I, I was uh, okay. I got I got off on that. Oh yeah. So I was um, the, the old thing. So I was thinking. I drew this picture, and it was me at seventy five. Okay. And what it was was a biker, an old biker. You know, like you see these old guys with the beards mm -hmm. and. Uh, a ZZ Top imitated them. Okay. They were young, but they grew the beards. Right, but right, right. That's where I was going, really. So I was on a motorcycle with that, with a hat, and 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 basically it was Don Quixote on a motorcycle. That that's that's what I had in mind, doing those kind of character roles. Uh, and Fuzzy Q Jones. I don't know if you remember that, but uh, you, that's before your time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Um, so that's what I had in mind because I didn't want to be a sitcom dad. Gotcha. A sitcom father-in-law, mm -hmm. you know, and, because there were, and then I saw, uh, so that's when I started designing. I was in, when I was in the committee, you know, I, I started to draw that thing. Think about when I got old. And then women, when they were 35, men, when they were 45 became sitcom dads, but women, when they were 35 to 40, you'd see they became sitcom moms. Right. I mean, and the only one who broke through was um, uh, Lucille Ball. She was a sitcom mom, but she was a movie actress, but she turned that into gold. Gold, man. right. She became right. the Charlie Chaplin of TV. Yeah. I mean, she was amazing. The, the only one who's done that recently is Brian Cranston, who used to be a sitcom dad. Dad, and, and then Breaking Bad. Right. So those are the only two that succeeded perfectly what i had in mind when i was 35 i saw it coming uh but um when i did uh, breaking bad um i just got out i mean it was, it was just it wasn't me i'm not an actor i mean i can't memorize these lines i have i'm dyslexic so uh it takes me a long time to memorize lines i can memorize lines but it takes me a long time right so in my contract i would have before i quit i didn't retire i just quit Okay. You know, I'll do my own, you know, that, that's it. I, I don't want to quit show business. I don't want to retire, but I just quit. Um, was, um, I don't know, it just, it's a long story, but.
that, that that's kind of uh, how I looked at acting. It, it, it was very cruel. Acting is very cruel. Would you cruel. would you rather do movies or would you rather do TV? Because I know you. I mean, you're in a very iconic film with Clint Eastwood, Escape from Alcatraz. From Alcatraz. It's probably my best role ever. Uh, I, I really like what I did. I, that's the only movie where I really like what I was doing. And what I was doing was nothing. <laughs> I had no idea what that character, who that character was, which was exactly why I was cast. Okay. Because I've watched that movie so many times. This kid, uh, Charlie Butts, was lost in prison. I mean, he didn't belong there. Right. Everybody else is murderers. And he was in for like check forging or something. It was, he was the wrong. And that's exactly what uh, Don Siegel wanted. And I was very naive at the time. I, I guess I still am. So he knew exactly who he had, but everybody was putting me on in, on that film. Clint Eastwood, the crew, Don Siegel. Until finally, I just got so angry on that movie. I was there for three months. About... A month and a half in, I was fed up to hear with the put-ons. They were just, you know, so finally I, I, I it's a long story, but I, I broke out of it. I, I, I um, basically, I, I kind of insulted Clint Eastwood. I mean, I just, you know. And, and you lived to tell about it? They respected me for it, as, and, and, and so did Clint, because they all knew, when is this kid going to break, man? Right. When is he going to fucking, you know, show yeah. my mom scene? And finally I broke. And and everybody applauded. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's just amazing. And Clint apologized to me for, you know, he had, he had, I, I, I held it in for, I think it was two weeks. What he, what he did was he walked away. I said, I dared to want to do another take. That, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. I was, I was, they were putting me on and putting me on. And blah, 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 blah. Char, in other words, Charlie Butts. They, they actually treated me like Charlie Butts. Butts. Hey, Butts, you know? And I go, oh God, but this is probably what that character would have been- Dealing with, yeah. Dealing with in yeah. prison. You know, he would probably have been some guy's girlfriend, you know, whatever. So, so finally, he, in one take, he, he, the habit was that Don Siegel, after every take, Clint Eastwood does not like to do two takes, only one take. If you want to do another take, he'll do it, but you have to explain to him why, and it better be a good reason. And it always was, it always was, Don Siegel and him had done five movies, had done five movies together. So they knew one another, but after each take, Don Siegel would leave the camera, walk over to Don Siegel in the scene. And he'd say, how was that for you, Clint? And Clint would go, yeah, that, that was good for me. He said, okay, moving on. Then you come up uh, and, and Clint would always say, yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah, let's, because he one take, he didn't. Right. Take, one take. So one time Don Siegel comes up to him. I'd never seen Clint ask for another take. Uh, now, I'd seen Don Siegel ask for another take, and then Clint would go, why? And Don Siegel would say, uh, the camera went off the, the dolly track. And go, oh, okay, fine. That, that's a good reason. Let's do it again. So that was the only time. And he goes, Don Siegel says, oh, how's that for you, Clint? And Clint said, um, it's fine with me. And I wanted to do it again. So I spoke up for the first time. I'm there a month and a half. And... Don Siegel would always come up to Clint Eastwood and never refer to me, neither one. I'm standing there like a post and they would have a discussion, you know, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. okay. And never, so I just finally spoke up and I'd say, um, I, I'd like to do it again. I think I could do it better. And Clint just turned to me and said, well, I don't think I can do it better. And he walked away and the, the, the crew just broke down laughing. And I'm standing there, both of them walked away, left me there, you know, alone on the sea, on the, on the, on the set. You know. and, the, and the crew was just laughing. And I got really mad, but I didn't know what to do. So for two weeks, 
I couldn't sleep. I, I got to get out of the barrel. I mean, I, 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 I don't care if I get fired, man. So finally, the day came, and I didn't plan it at all. Clint Eastwood said, and I don't even think he knew this. Clint Eastwood said what I had said when he walked away, verbatim. He said, when Don Siegel, after two weeks, comes up to me and says, how's that for you? And Clint Eastwood said, um, I'd like to do it again. I think I could do it better. And I said, well, I don't think I can do it better. And I walked away. And there was dead silence. <laughs> And I just kept walking, man. And I said, okay, the silence is behind me. I'm fired. Fuck them. Boom. I'm out of here. I don't care. I don't need this. I'm up to here. And all of a sudden, I hear Clint go, hey, Larry, come on back, man. And he was like laughing like hell. And the crew laughed too. And I was out of the barrel for the next month and a half. I was, I was king. I, was, I wasn't king. Right. King, but I was... I had respect. I, I it was a surprise to me. They just, so first. was this the first movie you were in, or yes? So the wow, first, first major movie I was ever in. I mean, uh, that but, had to be big, especially with Clint Eastwood. But uh, it was, it was a, 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 a what they call now a tentpole movie. I mean, they had more. Don Siegel was afraid of doing a lot of things because of the budget of that film. It was the biggest biggest budget he had ever had. Okay. And and he kept on saying to me, hey, man, I don't know, you know, they're talking about. It. In other words, like, can I do this? Or, you know, is it okay if I do that or whatever, something that would be expensive to do. And he would say, because uh, we were friends. Uh, Don Siegel and I became friends. We, we liked one another. He was like my grandfather, you know, just an old guy, white hair, yeah, this is great. Uh, so he said, I, I, I think so. And then one day I said, you know, um, wh why are you doing that? Because he had been telling me that, you know, the, ex the expense, man, I don't you know this budget. They're always writing me about the budget. You know, it's too, too much money, blah, blah, blah. And one day I said, well, yeah, but you said that the budget, you know, you're doing this. He said, they just called. They said, hey, man, it's turning out great. Don't worry about anything. So he told that to me. Uh, and, and I said, wow. And then everybody else was relaxed from that day on. Here's why. I can tell you why. Bruce Surtees was the cinematographer. And Bruce Surtees liked a lot of shadows, a lot of darkness in the shot. And it, what it does is, and there wasn't anything like that. It was very, um, you know, white bread mayonnaise lighting. Right. Everything had to be lit. No shadows. And Bruce Surtees in this prison was always going for dark, somewhere that had to be black, somewhere in the frame. Right. Some, and, and nobody was doing that. So that's what the big complaint was from L.A. They would say, hey, man, th there's black in the, in the, in the frame. We got to get rid of that. And they wanted to fire Bruce Surtees. For the first two weeks, Bruce Surtees, all the rushes were, hey, man, there's black in the frame. And everybody else who heard the rumor about, you know, they're going to fire Bruce because but I, we, I was watching some of the in, in TV village and I thought, wow, it adds depth. You know, that's way back there. And this is right. It, it adds a mood and, and an emotion. It's really he was using it so well. And Siegel and Clint fought for him. And finally, they said, well, you fire Bruce, you're going to fire me and, and Don. We're walking. And that was just amazing that they would do that, that they would stand up for this and for Bruce. Uh, and finally, they broke. I mean, L.A. said, all right, fine, you know, whatever, you know, OK, hands off. And that's when Don Siegel said they said it's OK, man. Yeah. We're, 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 we're cool. We're OK with money. We're so okay with money. has there any ever been a part that you wish you haven't done? Wow. Uh, yeah, this interview. <laughs> what kind of question is that? Uh, um, no, I mean, I uh, th there was one, and it was changed. In other words, it was so insulting to me. the costume was so insulting. Okay, to me that I go, what the heck is this? I can't wear this, and I just refused to wear it. So I, 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 
I'm not going to wear this. And, and so the costume lady just finally, I mean, she saw I was so adamant that she changed the costume. So it, that's, no, I didn't want to do the part if I was going to wear this costume. Right, I got you. It was, funny. It was just silly. Uh, she was going for a laugh and it was just wasn't funny. It was stupid, you know. Okay. Uh, so no, the, the idea is you turn it down before you take it. You, you know, and that's what I did with these last two. You know, you, you could see there's nothing here for me. I, I, there's nothing of, of interest. Right. And uh, and to explain it is is really stupider than just saying I'm no, I'm going to pass on this one, which I uh, which I just do. No explanation. No, thank you, thank you for thinking of me. Now. Uh So no, I mean maybe. You know, now if I look back on the first TV sitcom I ever did, I don't even remember what that is, but maybe I would look at it now and say, oh my God, that's so yeah. amateurish. But no, at the time, you always, as a matter of fact, I, I had to have it explained to me from a, um, one of my agents at the time. Uh, I, I, he, he said, you know, there's a part, you're up for it. And I said, well, what is it? And he, he said, explain it to me on the phone, blah, 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 blah. And I went, oh man, I don't want to do this. Oh God. Like I had to do it. I mean, that, right. that's what I thought. That's how, like, see, that's how naive I was. It was, right. I didn't understand the business. And he says, well, if it's, if you're going through that much angst, then why you, why do we, would you even do it? I said, well, because if I don't, if I turn it down, they'll never hire me again. See, that, that's the kind of thinking I had. And he goes, what are you talking about? That you turn it, well, yeah. And he said, no, that's not how the, no, you can turn it down if you want. If you don't like it, turn it down. And then he said something that I remembered the rest of my life. He said, Larry, you need a no. You can't just keep accepting everything, everything give, everybody gives you. I mean, so that's like a big life lesson to me. You know, and I'm like, you know, you're a young man. So, you know, like a first or second sitcom, third or fourth sitcom. Right. You know? So he said, turn it down. So he said, he, he, and then he I said, and he, he heard the hesitancy of, of saying no to movies, to acting, you know. Right. To, so he said, Larry, just turn it down. In the morning, you're going to feel great. And so I said, okay, I trusted him. I said, okay, I don't want to do this role. I said, okay, I'm going to turn it down. Thank you, Larry. Click. <laughs> and then in the morning, I said, yeah, man, turn it down. So, yeah, done, it's fine, man. You've done so much TV. Did Was there always a thought in your mind that you'd have your own sitcom or didn't you want it? No, I always wanted my own sitcom. That's what the old guy was all about. Okay. Where would I, where would I put him? Well, I, I wanted to be in movies. So I wrote, a, I have the screenplay now. I'm just about approaching the age where I could actually do it, the drawing, you know, from right. when I was 35. I'm, I'm approaching that, I, and I never thought, I mean, I really did think when I drew it, yeah, this is what I want to be when I'm, when I'm 75 or 80 or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, well, however old I pictured Don Quixote being, because I loved that book, uh, the real one, the Cervantes right. one, not the, I mean, you had to read three translations before you get one that, oh, this is funny. That guy knew jokes. Cervantes was so funny, man. Uh, but nobody knows that. Everybody talks about, you know, the importance of Don Quixote. The man, but it was a satire. He was like George Carlin. He was like right. Lenny Bruce. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. But you had to go through three translations. It's a translator that doesn't have the sense of humor. It's amazing. So I don't know. Uh, I, I wrote the movie and I, I thought if I couldn't do the movie, I would just do a sitcom about him. And I've written two, sit, two sitcoms, our sitcoms, and one feature for uh, Emmett. His name was The Outlaw Emmett Demons. I even have a name for him. Okay. So uh, that's what I pictured. And, and now I may actually be able to do it. You know, I was going to you know, sell it to somebody. But they, they say... When I was trying to sell it, which was um, when I did the big push, was in the 70s and 80s. And the sitcom and the movie uh, were too quirky. They didn't get it. 
was just too quirky. Now, uh, now it's just every it's quirky. Everything is quirky. I mean, hip hop is quirky. I mean, everything. There's no uh, you. I, I see a lot of things where they're just trying stuff. I mean, just throwing stuff at the wall. The wall stick. It, it sticks. It's just really and now. So now I, I have a shot coming up in the next couple of months is my time. I mean, so. And then with the, the way the industry has changed, because before you just either got it on one of the three networks or it was a major film. Now you have all these streaming services, all these cable services. Exactly. Would that And so that's opening your door up. So you would exactly. pitch it to, to Netflix or Apple Plus or whatever it may be. Uh, platforms and demographics. OK. Expanded. Because of the the earth and 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 the internet, I mean, uh, friends goes worldwide now. Oh yeah, they speak English over there, they get it. Even if they translate it, they still get the jokes. So yeah, uh, all the platforms and all the demographics and all the niches. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just wow. Yeah, like that. and anything goes. They'll try anything. The stupidest stuff I've seen. I mean, it's good. That's why uh, when we started off before we were on this thing, that's why I say we're going to be, I give you, I give us a thousand years, no human beings will be on this planet. And, I mean, we're extinction bound. <laughs> I think I'm going to write a book called Extinction <laughs> Bound. That or that or write an, uh, a pot, a pot uh, I can't even say the word, but write a movie about it. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a TV sitcom. If I just said, hey, I got a sitcom, well, what's it about? Uh, what's the name? T uh, uh, Extinction Bound. And they go, let's do it. Yeah. Let's get six and bank them. Okay, boom. <laughs> you know, that's a red because they just go on, boop, you know, yeah. with the hit, just a boop. Oh, that so goes in. If it just goes in. Oh, okay. Hey, here's your money. When and you if think, you don't have a good name, forget it. When you think of quirky, what is concept? One of the things you think of, and, and, and again, a program that was about nothing, which was Seinfeld, which you got to be on the last few episodes because you were going to be Kramer in their TV series. Right. Now, my question for you is, is there you're going into the into the room to audition and you nail it. And George is so worried after you leave about the raisins on the table. Was that actually written in or was that improvised? <laughs> that's a good question no i was i was written in um I, I tell you the funniest roles i've ever had or done were, were written i've never made up anything i mean generally if i say in the parts that you you you've mentioned in this interview all of them i've accepted you know i i, I, I there's no gun to my head saying you better do this or else so i read it and i said yeah, this is funny. And the reason that I thought it was funny was it was on the page. The character was on the page. If the character isn't on the page, why would I do it? Mm. I would have to like basically write the character to, right. to, to do it. And I, I don't have that kind of time or energy or interest. It's got to be on the page. I will, I will make it funny. I mean, the funny is on the page, but you can't print the page on a TV screen. Mm -hmm. So that on the, the funny on the page has to go into me and out. Right. And, and that's what I bring. That's why you're getting Larry Hankin to do it. I can lift it off the page and deliver it. And that's what I like to do. I don't, I don't like to work. <laughs> I like to show up and perform. Okay. Cause so. I, because I find that 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 part, because um, honestly, you could have played, they could have brought you in as his brother in one of the seasons, and you could have lived with Kramer for for so long. Because you you do, you and him and Richards, you and Mike Richards actually are very similar in your mannerisms on that program. Well, let me correct you on that. Okay, please do. Um, the secret to that character was given to me. Uh, first of all, my, Mike, uh, Mike, wait, what, what's his name? Uh, Michael, who did Kramer? <laughs> Michael uh, Richards. Michael Richards. Okay. 
Michael Richards and I knew one another long before Seinfeld was a twinkle in anybody's eye. Okay. We were, we, because we look, we look, we're tall and we kind of look similar. We don't yes. look similar, but we look similar. So we would be auditioning for, for stuff all the time and we'd show up and there would be Michael and he would be me because we we're going up for the same part, the tall guy. So we knew, and then we were cast as brothers in a sitcom, a restaurant sitcom where we robbed the place. Oh, I didn't brothers. realize that. Yeah, nobody does. It was a, it was a, it was a sitcom, it was on uh, for a season or two and then it would disappear. So we knew one another. So when they looked for a replacement, and I was up for the part of Kramer. Michael Richards and I auditioned for the part of Kramer. And, you know, we were there at the same time. You know, we were auditioning, you know. So we knew one another and, and, and they, and then uh, I, I, Michael got the part. And, and I think when I watched the show, when it finally went on, I thought they did the right, uh, we have totally different, this is what I want to correct. Right. We have totally different ideas of what comedy is. Okay. We, we talked about it. We have fought, or, you know, or, offset about what would be funny. And when we robbed, uh, it was in the, the sitcom, the restaurant sitcom, when we played Brothers, in the getaway truck, which was on a green screen on a stage. But it was the only time where we would it'd just be the two of us together acting. In the robbing the restaurant, he was you know robbing the cash register and I was keeping the, the, the patrons at gunpoint. So we didn't work together. We robbed the place together, but we didn't rob it together, you know? Okay, but when we escaped, we were in a truck together, which is me and him, and we had dialogue. So the director said, you know, rehearse, and then I'll be right there. So we rehearsed, and we were arguing, man, really hard, angry, almost coming to blows about what was funny about this scene. And he wanted to do this, and I wanted to do that. And he said, no, no, but, but you have to say this to do, no, and no, but that's not, f so finally when the director showed up and we were still arguing, you know, and, and now we didn't like one another, just over what was funny, right. which I would, to this day, I would like to have a recording of that fight, two comedians fighting over what's funny, probably is the most stupidest <laughs> argument ever, ever. It was just, so the director came and said, okay, did you guys work it out? And and we just looked at one another and said, well, yeah, kind of, kind of. He said, oh, well, well, let me see what you did. So I wouldn't give him what he wanted. He wouldn't give me what I wanted. So it just laid there like a, like a, a dead locks. <laughs> so, he, so the director said, this is what you worked out? <laughs> well, he wants to do, no, he was, all right. Okay, we're gonna do it as written, my way. Okay. End the story. Yeah, because so I, I, I always wondered that watching that when whenever you see you become Kramer, and again, it's it's an actor playing a role of someone else, and you did such a great job of it because you did do the persona. Okay, now okay, so now let me talk to that. Okay, please. Now, now that you know the story that I just told, that's the setup. Now here comes, okay. the, here, I mean, no, that's, that's a milieu. Here comes a setup and a punchline. Okay, so um, uh, when they, uh, then they needed a guy to play Kramer. Okay, so the, the, I didn't get Kramer, Kramer's on. He's great, he's doing it great. I wasn't jealous at all. I said, you know, Michael, you're doing it your way. And that's really funny. I would do it a whole different way. Good for you. So now they said, we need a guy to imitate. And Michael said immediately, get Larry Hankin, man. You know, he looks like me. We work together. I mean, he gave me a good spiel. So they called me and said, hey, you know, could you do Kramer? Uh, so, uh, yeah. I, I, I know. Yeah, could you audition for a guy imitating Kramer? It's my agent. Yeah, okay, fine. So they said, okay. So when I said, okay, I just wanted the job. And I wanted to be on Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. they, it's a funny show. I, I didn't, it had nothing to do with Michael or Kramer. It had to do with me wanting to work. 
Right. So I said, yes. In the mail, I got the VHS tape of the show that Michael Richards playing Kramer did that I was going to audition for in the show. In, in other words, I auditioned as Kramer, right? Right. Okay. The audition that I did as Kramer was actually a scene from a previous mm -hmm. Steinfeld show that had Kramer in it. They just gave me that show and that scene with Kramer, the film of it, and they said, this is going to be the audition scene. You're going to do this scene that Michael Richards is doing as Kramer. That's the audition scene. So all you have to do is imitate Kramer. <clears throat> So they sent it to me two weeks before my audition. Well, I watched that Kramer scene a thousand times. And when I went into the audition, all I was doing was my best Kramer. Impersonation. Okay. In my, there was no acting whatsoever okay. in that scene. Pure mocking imitation. And I did it perfectly. I've watched it. I go, yeah, Larry, that's it. And so that's how you do it. You, you, you figure it out. I love acting for that, but only for that. I, I don't like the big parts. I don't like the rehearsals. I don't like to go into locations unless it's in a foreign country. I have a lot of, you know, likes and dislikes. So um, after, after you did imitate michael richards did you guys ever talk about that fight you had years ago um to, to i don't even think you would remember it oh okay i only remember it because i wanted to get the tape of that argument because it would be so ridiculous but that is like again my emotional attachment to the satirical point right. of view of that not the fight i don't remember what we were fighting about at all because I, I find that interesting, and I'm I'm going through, and I have a a, a list of everything you that you've been in, pretty much, from TV programs like Matlock to Alf oh, to, <laughs> um, to uh, Jake and the Fat Man. Oh my God! Wow! With, with all these, oh with all these listings, and and you look at it, and the thing I think is interesting in a lot of these TV, especially the dramas that you were in you usually play the guy that's down and out or the criminal of some sort yeah that that is usually high on something or whatever it is exactly. did you feel you were typecast no i was typecasting me that's the only part okay you accept. i i knew what i could do i wasn't an actor in other words if you give me a normal person that takes acting <laughs> because i i don't know what a normal person okay. uh, so you know uh, so I always look for the quirk the quirkiness the the edge the twerk the twist the twerk <laughs> the twist uh, you, you know I, I that's what gets me to do it you ask any actor any actor star or beginner you know why did you do that role or why what may what what is the mechanism that makes you choose a role it's also it got to it's got to grab me it's got to say you are this person you are what is written here if it doesn't say that to you then i i i don't have enough acting chops to get into it to to to, to bring it and I, it has to be given to me you know, i'm not an actor i'm, I'm a stand-up i'm a storyteller what I find is inter I find that really interesting that you say you're not an actor, but you've I had an act. I can act, right? If, if it turns me on, I got you. So you have to want to be it. I mean, you can it. make love to anybody, but you know, you gotta you gotta be turned on. I got gotcha. you. Okay. It doesn't work. I bet. That, that, I mean, not, I get. Because yeah. um, again, going through the whole thing, and I I just looking at this this list from you were on. TV, I mean, you were on TV series that are considered iconic now from Love, Sydney to Family Ties to Heart to Heart, Eight is Enough, Barney Miller, WKRP in Cincinnati. Uh, let's see. Uh, Benson. 
Laverne and Shirley and all these programs. And then I go back and I look at the movies you were in and you were in Steve Martin's The Jerk. You were this, the, but you weren't credited in the film. Why weren't you credited in the film? Because my part was cut, I believe. Uh, that 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 happened in uh, Pretty Woman, the same thing. My, my scene was cut. So uh, I don't get a residual because if my scene was cut, I'm not in the movie. Okay. I can't be identified. I am actually in the movie, but you can't identify you can't, me. I did. The camera's behind me. So, uh, and that I was in two scenes and they cut the scene, the scene where I was in. So if, if you can't be identified, then it is okay to take your name off of the credits because you can't be identified. And if you're not, if your name is not in the credits, you don't get a residual. That's how they send the residuals out. If your name is in the credits, even if you didn't appear in the movie and they left your name on the credits, you still you get, get a check. Residual. Hey man, his name is in the credits. It has nothing to do with whether he appeared. It's your name in the credits. That's what pays the money. So, and, and Pretty Woman, and uh, I guess uh, whatever that one was. What, what the was jerk. that? One? The jerk. The jerk. Uh, yeah, um, I I was filmed in it, but that whole scene was because it was a group scene, and they just cut it out. So, uh, so now asking you, with all the sitcoms you've been on in the movies, are you still getting residual checks from those films? Yeah, sixty six cents. <laughs> Forty-five dollars, six dollars, uh, for 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 being in a Walt Disney movie, I used to get two cent checks, ten cent checks. It costs more to mail it. Uh, yeah. So what they did was they stopped uh, issuing two cent checks, or, or they stopped following two cent checks. But the reason, because nobody would cash them. If you got a two cent check from Disney. It was a Disney check and a Disney check looks fake because it's got, you know, where it says pay to the order of yeah. Right before pay to the order of there's a the little icon of Mickey mouse going. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody would cash me yet. Is it pay to the order of Larry Hank in two cents. And you just want to save that check. Yeah, I got well, you. I was getting, you know, uh, over a year or two years, I would have like 15 or 20 checks of two cents. Well, all the actors getting two cent checks would not cash them because of the same reason. They're so cute. They look fake. I, I want to save these and send them to my grandchildren. You know, maybe they'll be worth money. So uh, Disney was sending letters to us, the, these two cent actors, uh, saying um, we will not honor these anymore because they're fucking up our accounting system. In other words, they would have thousands of dollars on two cents checks. Yeah, all with two cent, ten cent checks. <laughs> they couldn't. They couldn't balance the books. They said, Fuck these. So yeah, we we made our impression on the industry. We we, we made That's... Disney change its business model. <laughs> The first sitcom you were in, was it That Girl? It, it might have been. It might have been. I Because I saw it the other day, a, a clip. Somebody sent me a clip. And I didn't even recognize me. I looked like some nerd, man. Uh, the costume. I looked, I looked normal. And, I, and because of that, there was nothing happening. I mean, I wouldn't hire that guy. Right. If, if I was watching, well, this is Larry Hankin. Nothing. I no no take a piss. Yeah, I, I so I guess it was. I was yeah, just like, normal, you know, just slacks and a shirt and a white t-shirt, and my hair was combed neatly. Had a haircut, nice close cut, you know. Right. I, I, I thought, wow, man, that I've come a long <laughs> way. Well, but that's how I showed up. You know that that's. How I showed up in Hollywood, you right? Know, from, I, I I didn't say this is weird. Well, I was playing an AD, I think. That that's the part. Uh, so maybe that's what it, how ADs dressed dressed at the days. time. Okay. So you you made the comment that you turned down uh, two roles that were recently offered to you. Do you have anything new coming up in the next year, year and a half? Oh yeah, I got tons of stuff coming up. 
but I can only get my shit together. I mean, that that's that's the big the big thing is uh, because I'm a dyslexia, it's very hard for me to put things together. Uh, okay, so first thing is I'm writing a book now. That's why okay. I got all these memories. So the book is coming out. And it's about all these stories that I've been telling you, plus uh, a, a pile more. Uh, of just, just first person telling. It's just basically what I did was I had a, an interviewer. This is uh, two years ago or something like that. Uh, I called the interview and he said, hey, that was a really good show. And we were talking about my resume, you know. Right. What was it like to be this? What was it like? So I told him all the stories I had. The hour was up. And I called him. I said, you know, I watched the show, watched his interview. And I said, you know, those are interesting stories. I, I should be doing that in stand-up or writing a book about this. Uh, you know, um, could we just once a week uh, for an hour on Saturday? He had, a, he had His Saturdays were free. I said, can we do a phone conversation where I just tell you the stories and you record them and then send them to me and I'll write a book about that. So that's what I did about a year and a half ago. Uh, we were doing, uh, we did eight Saturdays for an hour, eight hours. And they sent all those eight hours. Right. Stories, just like if you would send uh, your thing to me. Uh -huh. uh, but they're the same stories, you know. And uh, there's an app now where you can put in uh, a, an audio tape and it'll type it out in Microsoft. It's amazing. And that's what he did. He, he fed the eight hours into this app and printed it out and sent it to me. So I had eight hours of me telling these stories that I've told you or some of them. Right. And, and I just retyped them uh, because it turns out, I didn't know this, but it turns out, spoken words are not readable words in other words if you took the stories that i told you and and printed them out yeah because of the pauses they're boring, they're yeah. boring. there's no timing yeah so you have to like it's basically editing it's cutting out the ums and uhs and side trips and extra sentences and stuff like that so that's what i did and i'm writing the book i finished the book last week and now i'm looking for an agent so that's one a book Second thing is I just got a call from another interviewer who does uh, documentaries also. And he heard the stories that I've been telling, like, again, like you and all the right. other people. And he said, hey, I want to do it. Uh, he said, I hear you're writing a book about this. And I go, yeah. He said, I'd like to do a documentary about the book. I said, well, it's not even out yet. He says, well, send me the book and let's talk about doing a documentary. So... I'm going to do that. So uh, I, as a matter of fact, after this, after this interview, I'm going to yeah. write him and say, yeah, let's let's do this. So I got the, the documentary. I got the book. And uh, right now, that's a full plate uh, for me. And I got to learn the guitar and I got some paintings to do. The guitar is really uh, I've written some songs. So I want to I want to put out an album. Oh, that's really? my bucket list. My bucket okay. list is uh, that. Because so I'm, I'm looking, because I'm looking, I'm looking on here that you have a, a TV series that's in post production called Stripped, that you were in two episodes. Uh, oh, yeah, it's still being talked about. Yeah, it's it's listed as released for 2022. Really? Uh, yeah. I hear the trees whispering, which is complete. Oh, that that yeah, that's a that's a piece of acting. Yeah, there. No, no, okay. Let. You have a second here. I want to talk I, about. Acting. I got as many seconds of you as you okay, want. Let me let me just tell you about acting. Okay. Let me just get this off my chest because there's a perfect example, and I just did this, did that a couple of months ago. First of all, it's a unique thing. Okay, the internet has come of age with that. What it is? It's a movie. It's a feature length movie. It's called "I Hear the Trees Whispering." It's about to be released. What it is, it's a digital movie done in a, an extremely weird manner. It's done from a per, first person singular point of view. It's from the audience's it's point of view. In other words, oh, remember uh, that horror movie that changed everything? The Blair Witch Project. That's it. He took that 
the point of view of the camera of the person walking through the woods. Well, he has it in the woods. It's called, I can hear the trees. Whisper. It's a lone man who has now gone into the woods to leave behind the world uh -huh. and take care of this forest. I mean, in other words, he's got a job, but the reason he's doing it is good. I can get away right. by myself. So he takes a camera and it's just his point of view. And, that, and you never see him. You see people talking to him and saying, you know, here's the job. And, and, you know, it's, and he goes, you know, the camera goes, yes, yes. And then he, he drives and you just from his point of view, he drives. And then he gets to the forest and he walks through the forest. Okay, so that's the first unique thing. It's from only one point. You never see the hero of the film. Second thing is it's done... It was, it's filmed in Austria. That's an Austrian forest. That's an okay. Austrian director. And it's an, and all the actors mostly are, the people who are talking to, to the camera are Austrian. So we did okay. it. In the second thing is that many, a lot of the actors are from other countries. It's, and the third thing is it's a very cheap made movie. If you can, yeah, just walking around like that, like the what's the something witch project? Blair Witch it? Project. Blair Blair Witch Project. Yeah, it's very cheap done. So what he does is everybody or most of the people in the movies, like me, I did it in my home. I did my part with my iPhone. Uh huh. The entire movie, half of the movie, most of the movie is shot on an iPhone. Or, or, or one of those phones. Right. Uh, so what he did was, I'm in the movie. So he calls, uh, he sends me an email. He says, Larry, I'm doing a movie. Uh, well, you can do it in your living room. What it is, is the man who's who the hero is, one of the reasons he's living alone is he doesn't want to take responsibility for his daughter. So he's kind of running away from society also, you know, paying child payments. And right. Stuff like so he has abandoned his family uh, and has gone into this woods. His daughter, I am, the, I am his father. That's my character. I am okay. this man's father. I am calling him on my iPhone. I'm sending him an iPhone message. You know, hey, George, your daughter wants you. And I send this to him and so in the movie he's watching this uh -huh. so the camera and then finally just go into it and it's just me on the big screen but it's done with this right okay so i sat on that couch okay uh well first of all he said the the director said um said uh you can, you can shoot it in your house. What it is, is you're the father pleading with your son to go back to his daughter. She misses you. I can't take care of her anymore. Okay. I'm getting old, you know, and uh, I think her mother is dead. The mother is dead. So please, I'm begging, please take your child back. She misses you. She knows you. So I did it, and he said, uh, just, you know, you can hold the camera yourself, doesn't matter, because it is a message from an old man to his son on an iPhone. So that's all taken care of. Uh, but, but please do a, a good uh, take, you know, uh, do it a couple of times, send me the best one, and then I'll send it back to you, giving you direction, which I didn't like. That, that was a bridge too far. Okay. Send it back and you know, so already I was a little edgy about. I just want to send it to him and goodbye. You know. Right. So I I did a couple of takes. I picked out the best one and I sent it to him, and I get it uh, an email back saying, "Well, it's not really that good. It's a little you know, do it do it better, and could the lighting be a little better." Uh, the lighting was flat. I mean, it's just, uh, it's like this, you know, doing this, but on a, uh, I was, I think I was sitting here anyway. I didn't want to do that. 
I, I mean, to be a bit, because here's a, another, you know, lesson of my life that I just live my life. I am very curious and I love to learn. I just don't like to be taught. Okay. He's teaching me. He's giving yeah. me directions from fucking Austria. Do it better. No. No. Okay. I'll do it my way. I'll send you another one. You know, I mean, that's my attitude. Did you explain so, that you walked out on Clint Eastwood once? I mean, exactly, man. <laughs> exactly. You got it. Okay. So, so I don't answer. I don't answer. Him. I just, I try, in other words, I try to do it better. I, I'm for doing my best. I'm, right. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not destructive. I'm not self-destructive. So I, you know, kind of used what he said, but I did it my way. Okay. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And it's not working. It's, I keep on looking at it and it's not working. It's not, I don't, he's going to not like this. And I don't like this. I want to do one that at least I like. And if I like it and he doesn't, then screw your movie, you know, get another actor. Right. Now I'm, I'm fearless that way. I'm not, I, I do not fear poverty. Okay. That's a, a down and dirty rule. I've, I've lived in my car for a year. Mm -hmm. I don't give a fuck, man. <laughs> okay. Now that you know that. Yes. Um, so uh, I'm watching the Lakers show. Now, my, my TV set is on, on this wall right here. Okay. So I sit about, well, I can sit in that, that chair right there and watch TV. Okay. So I'm sitting there watching TV, the Lakers game. And I got my cell phone right next to me in case I got a phone call. Right. I'm watching the game, it's halftime. And I go, oh, great. It's halftime. Let me just uh, rehearse my lines because it's the naturalness that I didn't like and that he didn't like. I wasn't natural. Mm -hmm. So I just pick up the cell phone and I go, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm watching a game and I'm going, blah, 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 blah. And I shut the sound off. Blah, 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 blah. Play it back. Still halftime. So I got, maybe if I should, and the light, there's no light at all. It's a TV light. So I can't even see me very well. I mean, it's not lit very well. So I go over to the couch and I have the kitchen light. The kitchen, you see that? That's the kitchen right in there. Okay. Right? The okay, there's a light in there and that light comes through there onto the couch, see? Comes through yeah. onto the couch. One light, that's all that was on. So I sit on the couch, so the light is hitting me crossways. This half of my face is in shadow, uh -huh. and there's this light coming, but it's just cutting across my forehead because of that, it's cutting across. And in the background is one of these pictures, just a half, mm -hmm. that's the thing. So I'm watching the Laker game, and I shut the sound off and I just go, I rip off another uh, rehearsal, you know, blah, 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 blah. Oh, the game is on. Okay. Boom. Watch the game. I go back. I say, well, let me see how my reading is. And I go, blah, 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 blah. I did three, two over there, one over there. Uh, the one over there is fine. And I go, whoa, I like that. That's natural. Of course, it's not well lit at all. I'm sitting right. on the couch and it's got that thick thing. Okay, so again, I don't care. I'm walking the Clint thing. I'm going to send this to him. If he doesn't like it, he can get another actor. Right. This is it. I got to watch, you know, something else. So I sent it to him. It's in the movie. <laughs> it he, he sent me a clip of the of the the section of the movie. That, so it worked. It's beautiful. It's great. <laughs> uh, I I mean, it's it's even the acting is great. So that's the question of my, my homage to acting is, right. I don't know. See, that's why I say I'm not an actor. That was, I was just doing my lines. I was just trying to memorize my lines because I have dyslexia. It's very hard for me to remember an entire long speech, right. you know, the first time. So it was just rehearsal. I had no idea that I was acting. I was doing it for lines. It's in the movie. So are, are you going to get credit for uh, uh, videography, for lighting, for set Cinematography, lighting, and <laughs> writing, too. Uh, yeah. No, no, not writing. 
No, yeah, yeah, you're yeah, right. Yes. Cinematography and direction. Yeah. And acting. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm very happy that he liked it. Um, I'm satisfied that he saw in it what I saw in it. That's really good. He's a really good director, that means to me. No. Um, and it, 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 it works. You know, I, I see because here's the other thing I had to cry, I almost cry, you know, please take her back, you know, she's, uh, she, she misses you, she misses you. So I had to, you know, fetch a little, I mean, there was acting involved. Right, I understand. But I was just doing the lines, man. So are you also doing voiceover work? No, that's how I first started. That's what got me okay. introduced to when I was in the, the LA, when I was in the committee. Uh, I would fly down because somebody who was down here already from the committee, mm -hmm. uh, an actor's wife, was doing voiceover production and uh, casting. So she would hire me to come down. And so I would see L.A., I would get friends down there, fly back. And then when I came down to get an a acting agent, uh, Laverne, uh, Penny Marshall saw me in the committee and she got me to do Laverne and Shirley. That's how I got an agent. Okay. So I got an agent in between acting jobs in the beginning. It's a long time in between. You got to right. pay rent. So I was doing voiceover work to fill in. Because the work. reason I ask is it's there's a listing here for Magnum Farce that your major culpa and it's your your voice that they're using. Is it an animated film? It's an animated film, but it's been up on uh, on IMDb for. It just says it was announced. I guess it's not a, it's not been released yet. So that's why I was just curious. Um, I, I did that like maybe seven years ago. I don't wow. Know. Interesting. So yeah, anyway, Larry, I good. could talk to you forever. This was fantastic. And okay. of course, I have other questions. But unfortunately, I know you don't have well, time. When the book comes out, let's do it again. I okay. was just going to ask you when the book comes out, let's do this again. And uh be able to talk about these things because yeah. it, it your career is just amazing um i can't I guess. Wait. that's why i wrote the book i, I, I swear I'm, one day i'm saying wait a minute i think my life has been amazing my yeah career, i mean maybe not my life but my career has been pretty because cool. the, the, just look at your list of credits that you've done is again just amazing starting all the way back in 1966 and still working today and not just doing one or two things i mean you've done multiple things it many years of doing that which is great here's an anomaly but I've, I've never been able to un, unpack and all those things that you see me a lot of them are, are iconic you said yeah nobody's ever asked me to do a sitcom or been a regular on any show that amazes me that really does blows my mind i don't i don't get it I don't think I'm, uh, I'm I'm easy to get along with. I think that's what shows when I go, I do one show. Really? I, I do it my way and yeah. Yeah, I, I just don't give a fuck. I, and again, that, they that's- like, so They don't like negativity. Well, they don't like feedback. They don't like people who do it their own way. You know, I, I wanted, like for instance, uh, Breaking Bad. Yeah. You know, well, when I kept the, the, the cop out of the Winnebago. Yes, the bullet holes in it, yeah. That, that entire part that of me walking and you can't go in there, I, all, I improvised that. Well, that was written. Right. I improvised it because I couldn't memorize it. I didn't have the time. They gave it to me the day that I showed up. That's a no-no in my, in my right. pantheon. No, I, I have to get the, the, the parts early so I can memorize it. And it's in my contract. They send me the part earlier so I can memorize it. That was put on my desk the day that I showed up for work for that part. That's just an impossibility. I can't do it. <clears throat> so I didn't tell anybody. They said, you know, okay. And I did one scene, which I did memorize. It was only five lines where I sold, where Brian sold the Winnebago to me. Yeah. And I said, yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. You know, I blew him off. It was great. I love blowing off a star. I mean, the character was blowing right, I got the character you. off, and it was great to act, you know. And the more I blew Cranston off, you know, yeah, yeah, right, sure, yeah, boom. The more I did that, the more he loved it, which is, you know, just the opposite of real life. Right, of course, yeah. Like for instance, once I auditioned for the, 
uh, the president, a Robert Redford movie, or The Candidate. Okay. I auditioned for a part. I didn't get the part. Oh, maybe I did. I don't know. But what he did was when I met Redford, it was it was where it was a great realistic scene. Robert Redford was a candidate, and he left the the, the tumult of the room where they were voting or whatever, and he had to go to the bathroom. And my character saw him go to the bathroom, and I wanted to talk to his character, so I ran in after him. And so he's standing there. Robert Redford is standing there at the urinal pissing. And I, as an intruder, an interloper, you know, I come over to him, start talking to him while he's pissing, which is, you know, like disturbing. Right. So he said to me, Robert Redford came over to me before the scene. And he said, look, I mean, you know, I'm going to the bathroom here. Your character's coming in. So I'm going to blow you off really seriously because I don't like, you know, the character doesn't like somebody bothering him. What the fuck? So I'm going to blow you off, man. So don't get pissed off. I'm going to really blow you away. You know, so that was really nice of him to tell me that I'm going to get serious. Mm -hmm. You're bothering me. I'm going to say, serious. so I came in and I said, blah, 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 blah. And he, hey, man. And he just really, and I, so much so that Larry Hankin got insulted. I mean, that's how serious he, he did it. Right. He, and so I left and he said, so I'm going to blow you off and just walk out. Of, of the bathroom, you know. Right. He said, okay. So I come in and go up here. And he bam. And, I, and he slammed the door as he left. And I'm just left there alone. Boom. End the scene. And it was really great. I never saw him again. So I took it. He, he really blew me off. I mean, he didn't <laughs> say goodbye. He just blew me off. He wasn't acting. Uh -huh. just, and I didn't get the part. So he must have been real. That was not fake. <laughs> I was personally insulted. It was so real. Yeah, so, but at least you were so insulted by Robert Redford. Real. I mean, it wasn't. I mean, I'm sorry. Was say that again? I said, hey, at least when you were insulted, you were insulted by Robert Redford. It wasn't some. Yeah, some some fly by night, yeah. you know, lemonade guy. <laughs> um, yeah, but but what I, what I learned from all of this, of what we talked about, and all what's in my book, is, is that. Acting school is, uh, is bullshit. No actor I have ever did a scene with acted from the same place right. or used the same techniques or had the same tricks or, or, or the same deflections. Uh -huh. Every actor, sooner or later, if he becomes an actor and gets serious about you know, being an actor, starts to you form your own school of how to do it. Some actors, I, I would be talking to an actor, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and they go, I'll say, I'm talking to Frank. Blah, 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 blah. Hey, Frank, you're up. You know, up. And he just goes in and he does the scene. I've, I've talked to uh, many stars who do that. Mm -hmm. Blah, blah, blah. And I can't do that. I have to quiet my mind. I have ADHD too. I have to quiet my mind. And a lot of people say, Clint Eastwood said, when he saw me do that, you know, just... Just be quiet. I mean, I wasn't doing this. I was just right. kind of sitting quiet, just being quiet. And when I looked up, I saw Clint Eastwood staring at me. I was sitting in Charlie Butts' cell trying to just be a prisoner because I, you know, I wasn't, that's a new actor, you know. So I was just sitting in my cell being Charlie Butts. When I looked up, there's Clint Eastwood staring outside the cell, looking in. He's got his arms folded across his chest. He says, what are you doing? I go out. I'm, I'm just sitting in the cell, you know. You a method actor? No, no, no. Good, because I don't like method actors. <laughs> well, that fucked me up for about three, four days, man. So, and now he's not a method actor. He can just talk to you. And oh, yeah. hey, boom, and just... yeah. Other actors have to, there's a need, and none of them do the same. Here's, a, here's one. I, I just got to tell you this, and then we got to be finished. Okay. Uh, I don't remember the name of the actor. He did, um, it was a, it was a, he was a sheriff. I don't know. It was a famous actor, big time famous actor. I'm doing a scene with him. And in the middle of the scene, blah, 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 blah. 
And he just, in the middle of the scene, I mean, no cut, no one, he just walked away and he walked behind the camera. Okay. So the director goes, cut, and nobody said anything. You know, this, this major actor, star, just in the middle of a scene, walks out of the scene, walks behind the camera, and then very slowly, you know, on the camera, the uh, director says, cut. So we all just waited. Like everybody knew what was going on, except me. And I didn't know what was going on. And then he very slowly, this star, comes back and he walks back and he walks back into the scene. He said, and then he goes, okay. And so we do it again. And now this time he goes all the way through. So cut, okay. So I go over to him and I go, what was that all about, man? So I always ask questions. I always want to get, well, what are your tricks? I want to know tricks. Now that's all acting is, is how you get to be the character. It's all true. How do you, what, what was that all about? We're doing a scene and you just walked out. He goes, well, I wasn't feeling um, right. I, I, I don't think I was in, in the zone. I don't think I was doing a good job. So I immediately walked out of the set so they can't use the take. Oh. Because in TV, budget is king. And if you finish the scene, I'm the star. If I finish the scene, they'll use it. Whether or not I was good or bad. Fuck it. Budget. One take. Let's moving on. So if I stay in the scene, they'll use it. So that's why I walk immediately out. So that they have to do another take. I've asked to do other takes and they go, no budget. We're no, we don't have time. So he, that's his trick to make his. Yeah. So I tried it my next part, you know, doing a scene. I'm not feeling it. I just walked out of the scene. Well, this shit hit the fan. What the fuck is that all about? <laughs> well, what are you doing? <laughs> Well, I doesn't feel right, so I just walked out of the scene. What do you mean you walked out of the scene? What the fuck? Who is it? <laughs> just <laughs> so I didn't do that again, uh, but I saved it for 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 my later years. Okay. Yeah, when I, when I do Emmett with the gray hair, I'll, I'll know. It's it's not feeling right. I'll walk out. Walk out. So yeah, okay. So that's 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 it. That's my lesson. <laughs> well, Larry, thank you very much. I really thank appreciate you. it. No, thank you very much. And when the book comes out, I'd love to have you back on again yeah. so we can tell more stories. Okay, cool. Hey. I gotta run. Okay. Hey, you have a great day. We'll talk to you next time. Okay, thank you, Bill. Bye. Bye bye. Hey, a big thank you goes out to Larry Hankin for joining me today. That was a true pleasure. We were scheduled for an hour. We actually went for an hour and a half, which was really great. Larry, thanks again. And everybody else, thank you for watching and listening to this edition of One on One with Bill Alexander. You guys have a great day. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to One on One with Bill Alexander. One on One with Bill Alexander is a million dollar baby production. For more information, go to BillAlexander.net.